Ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to welcome you to the 20th Schumann Lecture as an elderman of this city. This is an annual scholarly event organized by Maastricht University Studium Generale in collaboration with the city of Maastricht. This year, especially on the occasion of the, fifth, the 40th, that's over ten, 10 years, anniversary of the uni uh, University of Maastricht. The Schumann Lecture is named after the former French Foreign Minister and Prime Minister Robert Schumann. After the Second World War, he was a strong advocate of reconciliation between France and Germany. As such, he was one of the founders of the modern day Europe. Moreover, he was a driving force behind setting up of the European uh, setting up of the European coal and steel community. Today, the 10th of May 2016, all that may seem like history, but Robert Schumann's legacy is still very evident in Maastricht, and perhaps now more than ever. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest lecture this year is one of the most authoritative historians in Europe, Mr. Brandon Sims, Professor of History of International Relations on the University of Cambridge. Sims studied at Trinity, at Trinity College in Dublin, where he was elected a scholar in history in 1986 before completing his doctoral dissertation, Anglo-Prussian Relations, 1804 till 1806. The Napoleonic Street at Cambridge under the supervision of Professor Tim Blenning in 1993. Sim's research focuses on the history of European foreign policy. He has written a variety of books and articles on this subject, including Unfinest Hour, Britain and the Destruction of Bosnia and Three Victories and a Defeat, The Rise and Fall of the First British Empire, 1714 to 1783. His overarching book, Europe, The Struggle for Supremacy, was variably reviewed by the Telegraph and the New Statesman. In addition to his academic work, Brandon Sims also serves as the president of the Henry Jackson Society, which advocates the view that supporting and promoting liberal democracy and liberal interventionism should be an integra integra integral part of the Western foreign policy. He is the director of the Forum of, on Geopolitics and president of the Project for Democratic Union, a Munich-based student-organized think tank. In his lecture, entitled Towards a Pan-Continental Identity, a German or an Anglo-American Europe, Brandon Sims will take Schiller's words as the point of departure for a series of reflections on how European and German identity have developed in tandem, resulting in a current European identity largely based on the diffusion rather than the concentration of power. This contrasts with the British model which transcended national difference and created a new identity to enable the Union to punch above its weight in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, the Maastricht University and the city are proud to welcome this internationally renowned scholar to the birthplace of the European Union. Will you please welcome Brandon Sims? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Alderman, for th those very kind words. 
of introduction. I'm also extremely grateful for the invitation. I'd like to thank uh, the Committee of the Studium Generale, uh, Maastricht University, and of course the muni Municipality of Maastricht uh, for having me and giving me this opportunity uh, to give uh, a truly prestigious uh, lecture. Um, Maastricht, of course, is a city, we've already just heard it, uh, uh, whose name is inextricably linked to the process of, of European integration. Uh, you all know that. And, of course, Robert Schuman uh, is one of the, if not the, uh, founding fathers of the European project. I feel particularly honored when I look at the list of the previous speakers. Um, I list a few in reverse order. Without any attempt at completeness, they include Timothy Garten Ash, Ulrich Beck, Sigmund Baumann, Ralph Darndorf, Guy Verhofstadt, and Jean-Claude uh, Juncker. Um, so as I say, I do feel deeply honored to be asked. You've set me a specific task. The letter I received asked me to give a lecture on European identity with a particular focus uh, on the role of Germany. And I was to speak uh, for between 45 and 60 minutes. And to do so, I quote, not reading a text, but speaking off the cuff which I can tell you after a very pleasant dinner uh, with the committee is not as easy uh, as it sounds. And I will uh, take uh, to my aid uh, some reasonably detailed uh, notes. But I'm going to speak without PowerPoint. I don't want to distract you uh, with images. Um, and I'm going to take you at first on a little bit of a journey into the recesses of early modern German uh, and European history. Um, and for this, I ask your patience but I hope that you'll agree with me by the end that uh, when we're talking about the European past, we're always also talking about the European present. Uh, and of course, uh, the reverse is also true. Now my topic, you've heard it, is, quote, towards a pan-continental identity, a German or an Anglo-American Europe. My starting point are the words of the German writer Friedrich Schiller. Germany, but where is it? He asked more than 200 years ago. The intellectual Germany, he, you know, he noted, ended, uh, sort of began where the political ended. And of course, he was writing at the time of the crisis of the great German political commonwealth, the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation. And he was writing from the perspective of a frustration with Germany uh, being treated as an object of the great powers. Germany uh, hemmed in uh, in the center of Europe with a strong intellectual, cultural uh, identity, but not actually with a very effective uh, political uh, framework. And I want to argue that we Europeans, we continental Europeans, we Eurozoners, I speak as an Irishman, not as a citizen of the United Kingdom, find ourselves in a similar situation today, when the European idea has seized the imaginations of many, but secured, I think, the political loyalty of only few. And the argument I'm going to make is that the European Union of today resembles in many ways the old Holy Roman Empire of the German nation, with all the attractions and disadvantages that this implies. And I'm going to argue that what the European Union needs is the British or the Anglo-American model of political parliamentary union, which has enabled the United Kingdom to, as many have put it, quote, punch above its weight uh, in economic and demographic terms in Europe and the wider world. So my lecture is going to fall into four parts. I'm going to begin uh, by tracing the historic evolution of the German question and the European problem, or if you prefer, the German problem uh, and the European question, because they're one and the same thing, two sides of the same coin. And I'll show how this resulted in the European Union of today. Then secondly, I'll move on more briefly to explain why this structure as it developed is, was unsuited to dealing with the challenges of the past and indeed the challenges facing our continent today. I will then trace the historic evolution of the Anglo-American constitutional model, that's in part three, and explain its extraordinary power. And then finally, fourthly, I will set out briefly a path for the adoption of the Anglo-American constitutional model uh, by the Eurozone, which I argue is the only method by which continental Europe can master the challenges ahead. So 
I begin with the first part, which is the German problem and the European question. Germany has always been central to the history uh, of Europe. Partly, this is a question of location. Germany is, of course, has always been geographically right at the heart of Europe. This has made it the geopolitical hub of the European state system. Uh, all the interests of the major powers, be it France, be it England, be it the Ottoman Empire, be it Russia, later on even the United States, intersect not only in Germany, but primarily in Germany and its extended areas, that is the Low Countries uh, and Northern uh, Italy. So even for that reason alone, Germany would always be at the heart of the European story. But Germany has always also been an area of great territorial size, of enormous population. The population of Germany uh, was the largest outside of, of Russia and periodically of France, really throughout uh, the modern uh, period. It's always been an area of great economic strength. We tend to think of German strength today in manufacturing. We tend to think back uh, to the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century. And perhaps we rather forget that Germany, even in the early modern and the late medieval period, was regarded, uh, along with, of course, the Low Countries, Rhine Valley, Northern Italy, uh, as the economic artery and hub uh, of Europe. It was an area, if not of great military power, then at least of great military potential. Long before the German prowess, misdirected as it was of the 20th century in military terms, long before uh, the Prussian army of the 19th century, long before Frederick the Great, German soldiers, German mercenaries uh, were prized throughout Europe and controlling uh, the supply of German mercenaries was a major consideration for early modern uh, European uh, rulers. And yet, this great strength, this great potential strength, went hand in hand with incredible political, religious, and territorial fragmentation. The Germans were organized, to be sure, within the Holy Roman Empire uh, of the German nation, but they were not acting as one on the European uh, scene. And this meant, in effect, that for this earlier period, Germany was essentially the object of European geopolitics. It was the area that other powers wished to control themselves or to deny to their rivals. It was an area of contestation. And this is true whether we're talking of uh, the era of Charles V in the 16th century, that of Richelieu and the rise of France in the 17th century, or of Cromwell in the same period, or in the 18th century, or the period of the Revolutionary Wars and Napoleon, and so on. At each of these times, on each of these occasions, the weakness of Germany imported instability into the heart of Europe. Germany, as I say, was the area over which was, it was contested. Then later, we'll come back to this uh, uh, presently, um, when Germany was strong in the 19th and the 20th century, when this incredible military demographic and economic potential that I've mentioned was realized, Germany, of course, uh, became a massive power, a disruptive power, as we all know, and so it exported instability. But either way, uh, Germany was at the heart of the story. Now, the history of Europe, uh, particularly of Central Europe, therefore, is the history of mechanisms developed to solve this problem. And the first point I want to make is that the constitutional order of the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation, which develops after the Thirty Years' War, is ended by the Treaties of Westphalia in 1648, is designed to deal with this problem of the import of instability through the weakness of Germany. So it designs an internal political compromise in Germany, power-sharing arrangements between Protestants and Catholics, a balancing of powers between the emperor, the cities, the larger territorial princes, and so on. Matters of dispute are dealt with partly at the imperial parliament, uh, the Reichstag at Regensburg, partly through the imperial courts. When an impasse is reached, a compromise is established, the process of relation. You have an imperial military constitution 
which is designed to mobilize the military force of Germany to keep out outside predators, at that time mainly uh, France and the Ottomans. So this arrangement for Germany had a dual purpose. It was designed to stop the Germans falling out amongst each other and importing instability as a result. Uh, and it was also designed to stop external predators from taking over uh, Germany. So the Holy Roman Empire, this order for Central Europe, was a peace project. And the same uh, phenomenon we see throughout the 19th century. After the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars end with the Vienna Settlement in 1815, uh, we have uh, not the revival of the Holy Roman Empire, but the creation of the German Bund, the German Confederation, which again has a presidency held by the Austrians, a parliament at Frankfurt this time, not in Regensburg, a confederal military constitution designed to keep the French and the Russians out. And once again, the purpose is to prevent German squabbling among themselves, keep out the French and the Russians, to make sure that Germany is strong enough so it doesn't import instability, but not so strong that it exports it. So you see, I hope it's now clear, that the twin, there's a twin problem here of mobilization and containment of Germany historically. And that's a problem uh, to which Europe comes back to again and again. And I want to pause here for a moment and just give you a reflection of what I think that means for German, Germany's identity as it arises out of the German question. Because I think what we see in this early modern period through to the late 19th century is that the Germans have a, a sense of common destiny in the world. They have an emphasis on legality and consensus. That's part of what it is to be German at this time. An emphasis on resolving problems through interminable debate and process through the imperial institutions, which results in very little action and very few decisions. There are few joint military projects, things that the Germans do together as Germans in Europe and the world. And the whole endeavor is about the diffusion and not the concentration of power. That is what the design for Germany uh, is all about at this time. This solution does not work. It does not work despite the fact that it, in the early modern period, Germany was a very pleasant place to live in. If you think of it in intellectual terms, cultural terms, in terms of diversity, in terms of music, um, fragmentation helps. You know, if you, if you fall out with the choir master in one principality, you can move somewhere else. Um, so all this is good. Um, emphasis on legality, on due procedure, also good in principle. But it makes you fatally weak on the European scene. Germans continue to squabble amongst each other. They cannot agree on keeping out external predators. And it also means that the Germans are not really able to do important work within Europe. So Germans are undermobilized, for example, when it comes to dealing with the Ottoman threat uh, in the 16th and 17th century, even though the highest level of German imperial mobilization is in fact against the Ottomans in the late 17th century. But in relation to the size and potential of the country, uh, very undermobilized. In the 17th century, Germany fails to contain the ambitions of France's Louis XIV. And of course, uh, uh, it fails to deal with revolutionary France and Napoleon. And this is because Germans cannot agree, they cannot focus on threats, they consider threats to be remote until they land on their doorstep. The Ottoman Turks uh, in the 16th and 17th century are a classic example. So ultimately, in 1806, the German Empire collapses. So it is the failure of the German peace project. And this is the background to Schiller's anxiety, which I sketched earlier on, around 1800. And the 19th century solutions also fail. The German Confederation fails to deter France effectively. It is seen to have failed in the Rhine crisis of 1840, when the confederal mechanisms don't match up to what the Prussians are offering, for example. 
And all this leads to a sense in Germany that Germany is the object of the European system and needs to become a subject. And this is the background to the rise of German nationalism, the demand for a single state, political unity, and a different form of German identity, one based ultimately on aggression and assertion. That is one which begins as self-defense. And this is why we have, after 1871, the Germany as a disruptive actor on the European and ultimately the world stage. You're all familiar with this story. I'll just sketch it out. Imperial Germany's uh, foreign policy, which whatever reading you have of the origins of 1914 is a contributory factor uh, to the outbreak of the First World War. It's not in much dispute, I think, that uh, Hitler's Germany uh, after 1933 is pretty much entirely responsible uh, for the outbreak uh, of the Second World War. But these are hegemonic German political projects based on the idea of territorial expansion, compensating Germany's relatively weak position within Europe and, and the world as a, a, at large through territorial uh, gain, through mobilizing Europe on behalf of German interests. We see this in the First World War with the concept of Mitteleuropa, of gathering uh, uh, Central Europe into a German political and particularly uh, economic commonwealth to face out against the might of the global Anglo-Saxon powers. We see it, of course, in Hitler's Lebensraum concept, territorial expansion to the east, and later on in his idea of a fortress Europe. So this is the Germany which, as I said, exports instability. But that, of course, doesn't work either. It doesn't work self-evidently for Europe for the reasons that I've given, it doesn't even work for the Germans, because Germany is twice defeated. Mobilizing Germany, mobilizing Europe on behalf of Germany does not work. Germany, and here I quote uh, Kissinger, Germany is too large for Europe, but too small for the world. So there has to be a better way. And the better way, of course, is the European integration project which is, in structural terms, the continuation of the organization of the Holy Roman Empire, of the German Confederation, and all the other mechanisms put in place for dealing with the German question and the European problem. What the European Integration Project is supposed to do is to embed Germany in Europe and to avoid a renewed European civil war. It's also supposed to mobilize Germany for the common project of resisting Soviet communism. So we're back to the same issue. Embed Germany, mobilize Germany. And the entire paraphernalia, all these structures of European political integration have at their root this concern. The political project, everything that goes with it, council of ministers, parliament, the idea of political union, that is designed to bind in Germany. The establishment of the euro, the common currency, famously is designed, as François Mitterrand of France put it, to decommission Germany's nuclear weapon, that is to say, uh, the Deutschmark. So, again, containment and mobilization of Germany and of the rest of the continent is the purpose of the whole European project. But this hasn't worked either. It's working better. It's failing better, if you like. But you couldn't really say that it's succeeding. The euro, as we all know, uh, uh, probably to excess by this stage, failed to embed uh, or contain Germany, but rather empowered it. And I say this, and I ask my German listeners not to misunderstand me. I'm not suggesting here in any sense a German hegemonic project. What I'm describing here is a structural phenomenon of what happens when you have a common currency without a proper political uh, union to underpin it. In, those, in that situation, the largest member state will dominate, which, by the way, is what Margaret Thatcher predicted when she opposed uh, monetary union 
uh, in the 1980s. So Germany, without intending it, has in fact been empowered uh, by the euro, and the euro uh, has not worked in the way uh, it was intended. The European integration project has not mobilized Europeans for the common project in the world, or at least not sufficiently. Externally, the European Union is less than the sum of its parts. It is not making its mark in the Middle East. It has failed uh, to act in concert over Libya, failed to act in concert over Syria, with the result that we have not gone to Syria, but Syria has come to us. We are weak in relation to the so-called BRICS, uh, the new uh, rising global powers, and of course, we are failing effectively to deter Mr. Putin as he radically revises the European territorial settlement, the greatest overturning of the European international order since 1945, the annexation of a substantial part of a sovereign European state. We have failed as Europeans uh, to prevent or to reverse that. Now, this is not all the fault of Germany, of course. I wouldn't say that uh, for a second, but it is related to the German question. Because one of the reasons why European uh, foreign policy is so weak, I think, on these issues, is that uh, the enlargement process, both of the EU and of NATO, has turned Germany from a territory which, as I described earlier, was threatened on all sides by potential predators, now into a state which is surrounded on all sides by friends. And so Germany, in geopolitical terms, doesn't feel the military pain of the Putin threat. It feels the threat of migration, but it does, does not feel uh, the threat uh, of Mr. Putin. And, and yet the Germans play a central role in the formulation of a European uh, response. And we've seen, of course, the migration crisis, which again is not necessarily just or primarily the fault of Germany, but where the existence of a large German economic magnet at the heart of Europe uh, and the absence of ec effective external controls on the outside borders have resulted in the scenes uh, that we're all familiar with. My point here is that all this is a consequence of trying to do a federal task, a federal task which is sustaining a common currency, managing a common foreign policy for which you need a single army, and defending common external borders through confederal means. It cannot be done because we haven't given ourselves the structure. So as far as Germany is concerned, this is also the result, a consequence of using confederal means to embed Germany, which only empowers her, whereas you would require, in fact, a federal mechanism properly to embed Germany within a political uh, union. So where does all this leave German and European identity today? Well, I would argue that the nature of German identity today is rather similar to that of the old German Reich, by which I mean it is local and federal. There's a huge emphasis on regional pride. There's also a strong element of pan-European consciousness, even of universalism, the sense of being Weltbürger, citizens of the world. Europe protects them to a certain extent uh, from themselves as well as from others. But going hand in hand with this, and this is my crucial point, is a very hazy sense of the importance of sovereignty or of the importance of the common defense. And this is not surprising because as I've shown, the entire project of European integration was designed to deny Germans their national sovereignty, albeit giving them a sense of participation through the wider European integration project. And what has happened is that this has not merely affected German identity. My argument is that this German identity has become a wider European identity. If you like, the Germans have uploaded much of their pre-modern or early modern political culture into present-day uh, Europe. So instead of the Holy Roman, Roman Empire, read today the European Union. 
because there are real similarities uh, between the two bodies in terms of structure, in terms of habits. I don't, of course, mean to compare the Germany, uh, to compare it to, to, to the Second and the Third Reichs. I don't share the view that the current European Union is a German dictatorship. I think that the various cartoons we see of Germans in Nazi uniform uh, in Greece and so on completely uh, miss uh, the point and the truth. I don't believe that the austerity policy is a new form of Nazism. My argument, to repeat, is that the European Union today resembles a different sort of German Empire, the Holy Roman Empire. It too, the European Union, is also based on the diffusion, not the mobilization of power. It too has a culture of juridification and endless consultation. So we have a contained and disarmed Germany in important respects, but we have also disarmed our entire continent. We have in Europe as a whole a peace project identity, which is all well and good if we Europeans were the only peoples on this earth and the European st states of the European Union, the only states. But as you know, as you all know, they're out there, and some of them are quite close, a lot of states which are not part of that peace project, in particular Mr. Putin's Russia. And we are very badly configured to deal with that threat. So now, having outlined the problems, let me move on to part three, which is the Anglo-American model. And I wanted to begin by describing the process which leads to the establishment of the United Kingdom in 1707, at the height of the War of the Spanish Succession, which pitted England and Scotland, the Protestant parliamentary powers, against the Catholic, absolutist, territorially expansionist France of Louis XIV. Now, the point I want to make here is that the relations of the four nations of the British Isles, the Irish, the Welsh, the Scottish and the English, have always been fundamentally shaped by the European context. As far as England was concerned, Scotland was always a vulnerable northern flank. It was often in alliance with France. One of the oldest diplomatic relationship in Scotland, some in the SNP, Scottish National Party, would like to revive it, is the famous Old Alliance, which is the alliance with France, which encircles England. So as far as London, as far as Westminster was concerned, that was the ultimate horror scenario. Then you had the threat of Louis XIV. Add to that the fact that the Scots were completely broke, having in the late 17th century made a bad investment in a colonial enterprise. So basically you had a state default. And you had a possibility for radical change in the constitutional position. How so? Well, in the 16th and 17th centuries, there had been various failed union projects between Scotland and England. In fact, ever since the death of Queen Elizabeth I, Scotland and England since 1603 had been dynastically linked. They had the same monarch, but they did not have the same parliament. This was a crucial difference. So they were not acting as one on the European stage, or if they were, not with their full potential force. So the solution that is arrived at in 1707 is a very radical one. It is full parliamentary union between England and Scotland, creating a common debt sustained by a common parliament, a common army, and a common foreign policy. So it's a common Anglo-Scottish political project in Europe and the world. And the rest you know. The United Kingdom punches above its weight in the world, and still, in my view, remains today its fourth or fifth greatest power. Now let me pause for a moment here to reflect on the nature of this process and the resulting identity. There was, of course, a pre-existing sense of commonality, of Britishness, on that island in the 17th century, early 18th century. The idea of a joint destiny had a long pedigree. But the countervailing influences were so much stronger. England and Scotland had been at loggerheads and at war for hundreds of years. You just have to look at the plays of William Shakespeare to get a sense of the, the length and the depth of that antagonism. So the Scots and the English, this is my point in this connection, formed the United Kingdom 
not because they loved each other, but for the opposite reason. They were afraid that their enemies in Europe would exploit their, their common antipathy to defeat them in isolation. When they created the Union, important areas remained separate, the church, the law, education. And in fact, Scots and English, as we all know, remain antagonistic in many ways. But the political bond of union once created deepened. Scots and English, with help, of course, from the Irish and the Welsh, built an empire together. Above all, the peoples of the United Kingdom went to war together. The Seven Years' War in the 18th century, the revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars, the World Wars, of course, and so on. That's a lot of history. But Britishness, which is now such a fixture on the world stage, Britishness is that common history, not the reverse. It's not the common history which leads to Britishness. So my point here is that what we think of British identity and institutions were created by or developed after the Act of Union, after the establishment of a joint parliament, debt and foreign policy, a sense of common project in the world, not the other way around. The Act of Union was the start. It wasn't the culmination of a process. And it was, I think this bears saying, the most successful polit political union project on the European continent to date. Now, if we look at the American Union, we find it's actually a very similar project. When the Americans come out of the War of Independence in the early 1780s, they find they've got a colossal war debt for which nobody feels particularly individually responsible. They're faced by massive external threats by the British in Canada, by the French and Indians on the frontier, by the Spaniards in the south, in Florida, by the Barbary pirates on the high seas, because they've lost the protection of the Royal Navy, and they now need to protect their commerce. And there are huge internal divisions, which I'll come back to in a minute. And to deal with all this, the Americans have got very inadequate constitutional arrangements. The United States, as we know, it doesn't yet exist. The Americans, the 13 states, are united. There are pluralities plurality of states, they're united by the Articles of Confederation. They're actually much more like uh, the European Union of today. They don't have a single state. They don't have a union. They don't have an army. They don't have a navy. They don't have a national bank. They've got strong state identities, New York, Pennsylvania, Virginia, all pulling in different directions. So the founding fathers of America sit down to deliberate. And we have got a systematic accounting of some of those considerations in the famous document, The Federalist Papers. Now, what's interesting here is that these Americans look at the European precedents, and they reject them. They say, we don't want to be like 15th century Italy, the Italy of Machiavelli. That's too divided, and it gets dominated by outside powers. We don't want to be like the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, which was partitioned in 1772 and, of course, went on to be completely extinguished in 1795. They looked at Germany. They looked at the Holy Roman Empire. It's fascinating to see what they say about Germany. I read out here what Madison and Hamilton say. They quote, they look at the federal system of the Germanic Empire and found it to be, quote, a nerveless body incapable of regulating its own members, insecure against external dangers, and agitated with unceasing fermentations in its own bowels. Military preparations, they noted, must be preceded by so many tedious discussion, arising from the jealousies, pride, separate views, and clashing pretensions of sovereign bodies, that before the parliament can settle the arrangements, the enemy are in the field. And this reads rather like an American critique in Washington today of the European Union. But this is written by Americans looking at Germany and the Holy Roman Empire in the late 18th century. The only model in Europe that finds any sort of favor whatsoever with the Americans is the Anglo-Scottish Union model. They say specifically, John Jay writes in the Federalist Papers, he quotes Queen Anne's letter to the Scottish Parliament in July 1706, calling for, quote, an entire and perfect union. 
and those are almost the exact words that go into the preamble to the American Constitution, which speaks of forming, quote, a more perfect union. So the most important features of the American Union mimic those of the Anglo-Scottish Union of 1707. The common debt, all state debts are merged. The common defense, a single foreign policy, and all linked to a common political representation. Westminster Parliament in one case, Houses of Congress in the other. So that debt, defense, and democracy are all interconnected. These three have got to go together. Otherwise, it doesn't work. There were, of course, also some specific aspects. There was a strong executive for the foreign policy, the president. There was a House of Representatives and the Senate. And the Senate solves the problem of state uh, individual interest, of asymmetry, in a way that was perhaps more successful than the UK did with Scotland and England. So let me pause here for a moment again to reflect on the resulting American identity. The Americans did not form their union because they wanted to consummate a long-standing affection. On the contrary, they were aware of their weakness and their antagonisms and feared that these would get worse. If you read the Federalist Papers, it is full of references to American division, commercial versus agricultural interests, slave versus free states, disputes about who would get the Western lands, in particular, differences on foreign policy. If we don't have a single union, the argument is, then the people in New England will fear only the English or the British in Canada, the people in, in the Carolinas will fear only Spain, and so on. We, if we do not unite and create a single national interest, we will be defeated in detail. So my point is that the union does not reflect existing unity. Actually, rather, it reflects division and fear of future division. So United States identity, though of course to a considerable extent forged in the War of Independence, really crystallizes after the formation of the Union. The United States was conceived as a project in the world and for the world. And of course then the interaction with the rest of the world shaped that identity. In the 19th century, the expansion to the West territorially the Spanish-American War, in the 20th century, the World Wars, the Cold War, later, of course, the War on Terror. All these debates, the sacrifices, the rituals, Veteran Day, memorials, Arlington Cemetery, all of that that goes to make a consolidated American identity. The list is not exhaustive. My point is that these, generally speaking, follow the establishment of the Union. They do not predate them. So. Let me move to my fourth and final part of the lecture. If I'm right in this analysis, the European integration project has been conceived back to front. The idea of a big bang political union on the Anglo-American lines was abandoned in the 1950s due to various objections, principally from the French. Instead, the theory was unity would be achieved through small steps, peu à peu, politique der kleinen Schritte. There would be gradual convergence, economic, military, social, cultural, and emotional. Political union would then follow. This was the coronation theory, a sort of a long engagement. But I'm afraid the long engagement ends not in marriage, but at the moment uh, it seems to be ending uh, in tears. As we have seen historically, unions have not been the result of a coronation theory, a coronation process. They have been big bangs followed by transformations. They have been events followed by processes, not a process crowned or leading to an event. And if that is right, it follows that what we need in Europe today is an event, a dramatic act of political union from which hopefully a deeper pan-European identity can follow and develop. I think that event could borrow from both of these Anglo-American unions. It could take from the Anglo-Scottish Union 
the principle of multinational political union. In other words, European peoples would not cease to be nations, but for fiscal and military purposes, they would be a union. And for the avoidance of doubt, that means the end of sovereign states. But the nations would remain, just as today we have four nations uh, on the, in the British Isles, and three and a third of them are within, for the moment, the United Kingdom. And this union could take from the United States the method of mediated relations between component parts, how to manage asymmetry within the union. So a European political union model would look something like this, a union of the Eurozone. It would have a, an executive elected president. It would have a single debt and a single foreign policy, a single army within NATO, all of which would be uh, uh, sustained by a common parliamentary representation, consisting on the one hand of a House of Citizens, approximating roughly to the House of Representatives of the United States, and then a Senate, which would represent either the nations or the regions or whatever component parts uh, were represented separately uh, uh, from being represented by head. It would have to have one language of government, that of course in practice uh, is already English, uh, and you would see the end of the residual sovereignty of the European nation states. I say residual because I would argue that actually you, all members of the Eurozone, all members of the Schengen Zone, and everybody who does not make a serious contribution to their own defense have already effectively lost their sovereignty. And I think it's in recognition of that that these states and peoples are in the European project uh, in the first place. So all I'm really asking is that they carry on their journey to its logical conclusion. And if I'm right, such a political union will gain the loyalty and affection of its citizens if it, first of all, stabilizes the euro and restores growth to Europe. Secondly, it transfers funds, resources between the union and its citizens, not between member states. Try to imagine a distributive mechanism in the United States which transferred money not from the union to an individual citizen, but from Connecticut, say, to Arkansas. Uh, I don't think that would work terribly well. This union would have to protect Europe's borders from uncontrolled migration. It would have to deter Russian aggression. It would have to contain ISIS and other terrorists. It would have to, in other words, link debt, defense, and democracy in the same way as the United Kingdom and the United States unions have in the past and present. In other words, to create a community of faith in Europe, beyond simply the euro, but also to life and death, to security, so that Spaniards would feel uh, uh, involved in dealing with Mr. Putin, that the Dutch would feel involved over and above their, what they already are in what's happening in the Mediterranean, that the Germans would feel threatened even though uh, they are now surrounded everywhere uh, by friends. In other words, that we would see the emergence of a single European national interest, just as the authors of the Federalist Papers foresaw for the United States, and indeed, as it developed. Nobody now would say in the United States, if you're living in Alaska, I am unconcerned with what happens in Mexico. Or if you're living in Washington State, I'm unconcerned with what happens uh, with Cuba. It is one United States, one national interest. We haven't yet reached that stage uh, in Europe, and we never will until we have a single political union. Finally, and very briefly, how can this be achieved? Well, there's really only two ways. The quickest is through a pan-European governmental constitutional convention, followed by a referendum. Now, of course, you'll say, well, we've already tried that. But I think there are important differences to the previous convention. That was carried out more than 10 years ago uh, without a great deal of urgency, at a time when external threats did not seem very strong, the euro was riding high. In other words, it took place in exactly the opposite set of circumstances that enabled the Anglo-American unions uh, to prosper. And they produced an interminable document which nobody could read or understand rather than something of pristine brevity uh, and transparency. 
uh, which is what uh, uh, certainly the United States did, um, and in relative terms, also the Anglo-Scots. Everybody knew what was being intended. Nobody really understood uh, the European constitutional uh, project. Alternatively, one could achieve political union through a grassroots movement. I myself am involved in this in a very modest way. I run a think tank called the Project for Democratic Union, whose modest ambition is to create a single state of the Eurozone. Um, so any of you are interested, go online, uh, join me. You heard it here first. This is the answer. Uh, be part of the solution. Um, and I'm planning, and uh, plans are far advanced for a big conference in Hamburg uh, in the summer uh, of next year. So, but, you know, there are different ways of doing this, uh, but my purpose tonight is simply uh, to analyze what needs to be done. But one thing is clear. European political union will not happen unless we will it to happen, un any more than the UK or the United States would exist today if they had not been created as an act of will by their founding fathers. The European political union necessary to consolidate and develop what has already been achieved will not simply emerge or happen. The only thing that is likely just to happen without anybody particularly wanting it is disintegration. That indeed can happen and is in some ways happening. History is littered with failed political projects where liberty died and states collapsed. The Polish Commonwealth of Lithuania and Poland uh, was extinguished in the 18th century. The Holy Roman Empire, I've mentioned it already. And there are many other examples. So what's the alternative? Muddling through will not work. If we simply continue to muddle through, which is really the principle of the Holy Roman Empire, which did survive a very long time <laughs> before it finally collapsed, but eventually the euro will blow a fuse. Some say it may blow one in Greece again quite soon, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, at some point, a structure which defies the principles of political aerodynamics and physics must collapse. Or it could be a foreign policy challenge in the South, or perhaps especially in the East. Or it could be the question of migration. The list is getting longer every year. But going into retreat will not work either. Dissolution will not work. Even if we soaked up the contagion as a result of letting Greece leave, in strategic and geopolitical terms, we cannot, as a union, allow Greece to become a loose cannon, vulnerable to political manipulation by Russia or by China. Were we to give up the euro, we would then return to the Deutschmark. That would mean the end of the whole European settlement. It would be the reopening of the German question. Not because of any malevolent intention on the part of the Germans, not because of any behavioral difficulty on the side of the Germans, but simply because of the structural facts of the size of Germany and its economic strength, which are well known, and which is the reason why, for historic reasons, we have the European integration project. So we cannot go back. So to conclude, was it, what is it to be? Union or disintegration? As I've shown, unions are not about money. They have been about politics and security. So to finish, I'd like to leave you with the thoughts that concluded my recent book on Europe, which was completed in 2011 and published in April 2013 well before the annexation of Crimea or the emergence of ISIS in public consciousness. I quote, only an existential external threat can unite Europe. Will it take the form of a confrontation with Putin's Russia, perhaps over the Baltic states, Belarus or the Ukraine? Will it be a confrontation with an Islamist caliphate in the Middle East or on the home front in Western societies? Will the European Union become a more effective actor on the international stage, especially militarily? Or will Europeans duck these challenges, withdraw into themselves, and perhaps drift apart? If this happens, history will judge the European Union 
to have been an expensive, youthful prank which the continent played in its dotage and which marked the end rather than the beginning of a great power project. I thank you for your attention. <laughs>